Thank you both of you for this because these other universities are sending emails saying that it's very helpful for them. So thank you. So those of you who are taking a class for uh, credit, uh, homework is due. It was due on Wednesday, but we had no class. Some of you already sent it to me by email, but others, please uh, submit the homework. Also, I think Jesus and Ann are here. Yes, Jesus is here. Uh, your first homework has been sitting here graded for a while. I guess you came a little bit late that day, and so I did not give it time. So last time we um, so last time what we did was to uh, go in great detail these limitations of the use of the event horizon, which is of course how the in the traditional black holes are, are defined, and so that was part. Seven. Last time we just finished the short, shortest part because of our limitations of the standard paradigm. For black holes, standard paradigm for black holes. And the first was um, um, that is too global, the notion of the event horizon is too global. And I explained what it means. In particular, for numerical relativity, it's not very useful because we need to know the entire space time before we can tell whether there was an uh, event horizon. So if you're evolving black holes, that's not very directly helpful. The second thing was it is teleological. And we saw explicitly the examples of white metric. We'll see it again next, next, uh, next lecture, in which in fact, the event horizons form in a flat region of space-time, and they can actually even grow in the flat region of space-time in anticipation of a collapse that would ha happen you know, much, much later, 100 million years later. And that can be happening in this room right now, that the event horizon may be forming. And so somehow, that is not that useful a notion. And the third thing had to do with the equilibrium situation, um, namely the standard paradigm says, that equilibrium means space-time has to be, entire space-time has to be globally stationary. Not just the black hole, not just the neighborhood of the black hole, but the entire space-time. And in fact, in many of these laws of black hole mechanics, which we'll do, uh, in fact, what is actually assuming that um, the, uh, the, the, the entire space-time is stationary and using structure at infinity and using the scaling vector field all the, all the way to infinity, not to collapse. So that's what we saw. And then we started with the next topic, which was causing local horizons. And then the first part we did last time, which was marginally trapped surfaces, what they are, why they are useful, how we could hope to get the notion of a black hole in terms of these marginally trapped surfaces. Um, and now what we want to do is to, to continue along that line. And uh, the basic idea I told you last time, that, uh, that quasi-local horizons are yeah, you can think of them as being world tubes of these marginally trapped surfaces. So it's the world tube. You stack them. You stack mar marginally. Uh, trapped surfaces on the top of each other, you follow 
what we call the evolution, and you'll obtain a one tube of modular carbon surfaces. So this will be a three-dimensional object, and this will be the cause of local horizon. And now what we are going to do first is, so these cause local horizons are going to be divided into two, two parts. And you can do simultaneously everything, but it becomes uh, pedagogically a little more complicated. The first part is equilibrium situations, which will generalize this, this standard paradigm, which assumes global killing vector field. We are not going to assume any killing vector field at all. So equilibrium situation. And the other one is dynamical situation. So basically, if a gravitational collapse occurs, then during the collapse, the horizon is actually growing. Uh, the, the, margin, the area of the marginally trapped surface is actually is increasing, and there is a dynamical part. And then, when the black hole settles down, then in fact it becomes an isolated horizon. Nothing falls across the black hole. That is the idea. So equilibrium means it's isolated. Or nothing falls across it. Um, and dynamical situations is of course a dynamical, so the, the horizon is growing, or the area, the margin of <coughs> <top> surfaces <coughs> is increasing. Uh, for definiteness and for simplicity, when I discuss these things, most of the time I'm just referring to classical general relativity as opposed to quantum gravity. In quantum gravity, because of a Hawking effect, the area can also decrease and then something else happens. But I'll here restrict myself to classical relativity and then I then tell you what happens during the evaporation process. It will be, it will be fairly clear uh, at then. Okay, so these are the things. So these objects are called isolated horizons because nothing falls across them, and these objects are called dynamical objects. <coughs> so, we're now going to do these isolated horizons. First. And I would like to explain what has happened. So these isolated horizons would generalize the idea of the killing horizon. So basically what it does is, it says killing, killing vector field is extremely strong global condition. So what isolated isolate horizon notion does is to extract from the notion of a killing horizon only those properties which are kind of very local to the horizon itself, not outside, and which are necessary to, for example, establish the laws of black hole mechanics and such. Thing. So we're extracting from the very, very strong conditions that there is an isometry, that there is a killing vector field, very, very sort of weak part of it, which is really necessary for the black hole itself. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Okay, as in the horizons. Um, so how do we do it? So the idea here, as we saw, is that nothing falls across it. Yeah. So here, when you say nothing falls across, you mean pullback of a stress energy tensor is zero? Uh, no, the, the, the pullback is not zero, because, for example, you cannot charge black for nice and awesome space time, the statement is that you've got a, uh, you've got a stress rate tensor at, at the horizon, but it means that TAB times the null normal to the horizon, so that means isolate nothing possible. If you take the stress rate tensor, you take the null normal, it means the null normal to the horizon. So, that, so this actually, this quantity is, is usually the time back vector field and the flux of energy or something or angular okay. momentum etc will be done. So we're saying that this this is and, and, and this index pulled back to the horizon, so projected out to the horizon. So we're not saying anything about yeah. Um isolated horizons. Uh, so the idea is that nothing falls across it, so therefore we want to I want to understand what it is. So let us go back to what we did when we first introduced the notion of the marginally trapped surfaces. So I had this picture up here in which I got some two two dimensional surface, yes, uh, being written as a circle, but it's really two dimensional surface up here. And then from here I can look at the outward going geodesics. 
is outward Malgeodesic geodesic LA. And then there's also coordinate inward going Malgeodesics. Okay. So basically given it in any curved space time, if you give me a space like two surface, I'm assuming it to be S to be a close to surface. A close to surface technically just means it is compact and has no boundary. So I give it two close. I always will draw it as S2 because the two sphere is the most interesting physical case. But there are some exceptional cases where three torus topology can also arise. And if you have positive cosmology, if you have negative cosmological constant, so anti distance space time, then the horizons can have other topologies. But for us, our universe, if the cosmological constant is small and it's positive, so in that case, these two, two spheres up here uh, are going to be two spheres, so I'm always going to be drawing them as two spheres. So I got this, this, this object up here. And then we introduce a notion of an expansion. So on this two surface, we introduce uh, intrinsic metric. It's a plus plus metric, or I say D, which is a projection operator into two sphere. So this I say D is just equal to delta AB um, plus LA and B minus plus. Um, so, this is the, uh, so if I take uh, the data is equal to this one. Okay, so it is just, this is a projection operator, L and L. So, this, and, and then this is a positive definite metric. If I lower the index, I just get a positive definite metric. Um, so, then the statement is up here that um, we could define using this. Uh, shear and expansion. So the expansion of, for example, the null normal L was obtained by taking um, the derivative, covariant derivative, four dimension of L, but projecting both indices on along the uh, so along the two sphere. So I'll get here SAD and contracting them, <coughs> and the shear okay, was defined to be equal to SAC, the trace free part. S A C um, S B uh, D minus one half um, S A B C S A C. Okay. So that was the shear that we saw last time, and we saw understand the expansion. Expansion is the area of these two spheres is increasing here, decreasing along again. So expansion is positive for L, and it's going to be negative for L, and and then shear is, is it doesn't have anything to do with whether the two spheres are expanding or not. It has to do whether or not this, there, is a, there is rotation or this angular momentum up here. Um, so that that's uh, there is shear. Let us not talk about angular momentum. Just there is shear. So the the null generators are sort of shearing as you go along. And as we saw last time, um, yeah. So these were the two two objects up here. And the statement was that for a marginally tracked surfaces, this theta sub l was equal to zero. So there's no expansion. So now there is a simple ex there is a simple uh, uh, equation which is called right to the equation. It's just a different geometry. You can just play around and see what happens. It is true for any kinds of geodesics, but here we are interested in null geodesics. So we are going to look at the right to the equation. Supposing we start the two sphere like that, and we take this L, and supposing we make L to be a geodesic vector field. So supposing we do it LA grad A and B equal to zero. We can always, in other words, I, I have L vector field and I just extend it along geodesics up here. So then I'll get a geodesic flow. And along this flow, I got these two surfaces, and therefore I can always take, for example, let's, let's suppose that the affine parameter is V. So this is the affine parameter. So 
So this surface that we started out with could be V, could be naught, and then I could look at a future surface up here. This could be V, could be V1. And so on these surfaces, I can just define the expansion as shear everywhere. And what the dry theory equation says is that how does this expansion change? So it talks about theta dot. How does this expansion <coughs> change as you go along this, this flow? So the time derivative, like a motion sphere are regarded as time, so how does this change? And the right of the equation just differential geometry, you, you play around with. Uh, theta already has one derivative of L, right? Theta has one derivative of L. Theta dot is going to have two derivatives of L, so you write down the expression and you just commute the derivative operators, you get a curvature tensor and manipulate it. And you, you find that this is just equal to minus one half theta squared plus sigma a d l sigma c d l times this. You can contract with either the metric, four metric, or the two metric, because these are already projected. That's, I just contract it, uh, let's say, c s p d um, plus four-dimensional Ricci tensor. So this is a four-dimensional Ricci tensor of the metric tensor times L A L D. Okay, so this is an identity. So this is this identity. It doesn't use any physics, it's just different geometric <coughs> identity. That the dot of theta is just given by this, this equation up here. And this right to the equation plays a very important role in the singularity theorems. Uh, it's in fact from the center to the singularity theorem. So one is always looking at what happens to its expansion along geodesics. So it's uh, uh, it is very important for singularity theorems. Okay. Now what you notice up here is the following. For the marginally trapped surface, if this is a marginally trapped <coughs> surface, this quantity is just zero. And I told you that what we're interested in is really taking these marginally trapped surfaces and stacking them. So basically, these are all marginally trapped surfaces. We just stack them if I wanted to isolate a horizon. Okay. So we're, we're just going to be marginally trapped surfaces. I mean, if I wanted any of the quasi local horizons, we're just stacking the marginally trapped surfaces up here. So if you stack, if, if that is the case, then theta is just zero everywhere. Theta of v is equal to zero. So <coughs> for the whole tube, of marginally trapped surfaces, okay. theta is just equal to zero, <coughs> hence if the marginally trapped surface, if in fact the, if the, the stack of mar the quasi local horizon or the stack of these marginally trapped surfaces is just these three manifold, so if this is a quasi local horizon, If this is a quasi local horizon, then all of this theta will just vanish. And in that case, um, so if um, um, the whole cube is a quasi local horizon, then theta is equal to zero, theta dot is equal to zero, because theta is equal to zero everywhere. So that tells us immediately that sigma AB, let me just call it sigma AB squared plus RAB as AB equal to zero. Remember sigma is a two-dimensional tensor. This metric is plus plus, close to sphere. The metric on this is, is plus plus. SAB is a plus plus metric up here. Therefore, this quantity is always positive definite. And that is why I just put <coughs> sigma squared. And now, now, for the first time, we bring in physics. If, in fact, we have got Einstein's equations, and if the stress energy tensor satisfies the, the, uh, the dominant energy condition, for example. So the statement is that now bring in field equations. So far, we cannot do that. Now we bring in field, field equations. And then we know that um, RAB, LAB, is going to be the same as the Einstein tensor times LAB. The reason is because the extra term is just scalar curve, which is a metric, but the metric hits this. This is a null vector, so I just hit zero. 
And this quantity is equal to 8 pi. We're setting g equal to 1 most of the time. 8 pi times TAB. Now, the dominant energy condition, it says that RAB times LA for any null vector field LA is a pass directed null vector, a pass directed causal vector, not necessarily null. It could be time like or null. This says it's a pass directed causal vector, which means that if I got two null vectors, or if I have two causal vectors which are future directed, the inner product is always going to be uh, negative. If this is past directed, this of course is future directed. Let me just assume here LA is future pointed. Okay, let's just assume that. Then the statement is field equations will be. <laughs> that this quantity is past directed, therefore if I take it in a product, the future directed one, I'll get past it. Future future is negative, so future past is, 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 is positive. Therefore this will imply that RAB, RAB is positive. But if in fact this null surface, which is spanned out by this geodesics LA, if that null surface, um, had the property that all these sections that I've written down up here are uh, expansion free, so the area is the same, area doesn't change, that's what expansion free means, then we know that this is equal to zero, but the energy condition says that this is always bigger than equal to zero, and therefore hence, if the null surface Um, let, let's call this null surface N. Let's give it the name. Give the null surface N. Obtained by stacking. This, uh, this, uh, this uh, it is obtained by stacking the marginally trapped surfaces. If this null surface L is, of course, in open horizon, then we put these two things together. This one says that the sum is positive or is non negative. This one says that this is non negative. Therefore, of course, each of them is not negative. Therefore, the, 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 therefore the statement, sorry. Uh, this, this equation says that this is actually zero. I'm sorry, it's a, I said something else. But th this, this equation says that this sum of these things is zero. This is positive. This is manifestly positive. So if that is zero, then both of them are zero. Therefore, then sigma AB equals zero. And AB equals zero. So in particular, the statement is that this will say that that nothing is you know, nothing is going to be falling across the horizon because if I take yeah. so the so the statement is that this actually does imply because L is an normal to the horizon if I put it in like that nothing falls across the horizon. This physical meaning of that is nothing no matter uh, matter does not fall falls across the horizon. I should just say, no energy, no matter energy. Energy or momentum or angular momentum falls across the horizon. So this is, tells, so right to the equation gives us an obvious way to define isolated horizons. So what I did up here was to just tell you mathematical identity, and then said that let's suppose apply this mathematical identity to the congruence of null geodesics, which are emanating from a marginally trapped surface. Then I made an important assumption that let's suppose that this congruence of geodesics, this surface N that we obtain up here, spanned by this congruence of null geodesics, has the property that all of the theta, the expansion, is zero everywhere, and then that tells us that if that is the case, then in fact, it is isolated. So not, no matter falls in. And later, next lecture, we'll see that sigma is kind of a measure of how much gravitational wave energy falls across the horizon. And therefore, what this is saying is that this is also equal to zero. At the moment, you don't have to know it, but that's what finally happens. So in fact, the intuitively, you understand what is happening, that there's no gravitational energy falling across, there's no matter energy falling across, 
And that is why the area of the horizon doesn't change. It remains constant on the line. So that is the idea up here. That, that's why theta is going to zero. So now we can do our declination. So these were sort of say going back and forth between mathematical identities and physical ideas. And that leads us to the definition. Definition. First, we're going to come out with non-expanding surface. Uh, non-expanding horizon. This non-expanding horizon is a null, is a smooth. Everything is going to be smooth, so I will not write smooth all the time. By smooth, we always been CN, when n is sufficiently large. We need n to be at least 3 because we would like to take, define the white curvature tensor and take its derivative. So basically, C3 or more. Uh, typically, it is assumed to be C infinity. So a non expanding uh, horizon is a smooth null in manifold in, uh, or sub manifold in, in space time um, such that. The expansion in terms of L of its null normal is A by zero. So the expansion is zero immediately implies, so implications, obvious implication is in the area. <laughs> of two sphere cross sections is constant. And we just saw here, it also says that the no flux of like the energy of momentum this horizon. <clears throat> and for the reason that will become clear in a minute, typically this non-expanding horizon are denoted by delta. Okay. So now the statement is that we'll just call this uh, non-expanding horizon. The delta comes from the fact that it's kind of a piece of the event horizon. Because it, I, I won't draw it again, maybe I should try. Um, so if I looked at the white dash space time that we did last time, right, we, we looked at the white dash collapse, so basically we had got some matter coming in from infinity, from, uh, from sky minus, and um, Then we are here, it's called this up here. So the matter flow up here is here. And then we got the event horizon forming here. So this is the white uh, space time in which there is <coughs> matter falling in from sky minus into sky plus. We saw this last time, and there's a singularity that's happening. Or here, we got flat space in Kasky metric, flat space. Or here, there's no more matter, so this is Schwarzschild. And then in between, there is this dynamical region that we fall, saw, which is because the battery is actually falling up falling in here. And we saw that here, the event horizon can start, does form, and in fact grow in the flat region of space time. So this, this region of space time is completely in space spacetime. And yet, the horizon actually, the event horizon actually starts, is the event horizon. And, and grows, uh, starts, for, is formed and grows in the flat region of space time. Um, but in this, in, the, in this space time, the statement is that there is no marginally trapped surface here. The so questions were asked about it. There is no marginally trapped surface here at all. In flat space time, there are no marginally trapped surfaces. There is no marginally trapped surface here. Um, and then we actually start getting marginally trapped surfaces here. So this is a, is a, is a, is a non expanding horizon, and this is called delta. So you can see that delta is only a piece of the whole uh, event horizon, and that is kind of the motivation why we call it delta is a piece, not the whole thing. So non expanding horizon, delta up here. Okay, so now what we want to do is, so that's our first definition, 
and we want to see properties. So it's a null surface, so in that sense it is like the event horizon, but its area is constant, whereas in the event horizon case, the area is increasing, and area increases because matter and gravitational waves fall into the event horizon. In this case, the area is increasing because matter is falling up here, but as we saw, it can also increase for no reason, no local physical reason. It can also increase because matter and gravitational waves will fall across in the future. 100 million years from today, some matter and the galaxy may collapse and form a black hole, and therefore the event horizon is growing in this room right now. And that, that could well be the case. But we just don't care, right? I mean, that we don't want to say there's a black hole in this room or anything of that sort. On the other hand, as we just saw, in this room, there is no marginally top surface. So there is no, there is no non-expanding horizon in this room. Yeah. Why is there no marginally <coughs> top surface in the, in the realm where matter is falling in? Um, it turns out, uh, we're going to say it next time, but the marginal trap surface actually starts forming when the matter comes up here. And so the marginal trap surface is, uh, the world tube looks like that. It grows up here, and then it becomes non-expanding up here. So here it is expanding, it's dynamical up here, and this is given by R is equal to 2M of V. And we saw that the weight diametric is M of V. By the way, those of you who might have missed last lecture, the conception it was very important. Fortunately, this gentleman I already put it on the on the web page, so that you can read that. Okay. So 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 that's what happens in that case. So that the but by the time the the dynamical horizon settles down, it is actually good. Is actually now we're going to see that dynamical horizon is space-like when it's growing. Its area is increasing and it becomes null when the area stops increasing. And therefore, here we've got all these marginal trap surfaces. Each point up here is a marginal trap surface. But there is no marginal trap surface in this region up here. Okay, so problems. So first of all, it's nice to have some definition, but th th does it capture what we have in mind? Right? Does it capture the idea that this not this non-expanding horizon is really um, is in some sense isolated? Right? That's what we want to say. Is isolated. That's. So that's what you want to understand. And I think pedagogically it's better to do it in some order so that you can just check what the order might be. The first thing is that, what do we have? So when I got delta is a three manifold, and we got the non-normal f. Okay. So here, I mean, in the motivation, I said that we actually shoot the geodesics up here. But in the definition, it makes no reference to the geodesics. It just says it is actually just a null surface, which is given to us, and L is just null normal, right? It is null normal. So, so this, this, this is null normal, but if you got a hypersurface such that the normal to it is actually, for null surface, the normal to the hypersurface is also transition to the hypersurface. So if it happens that the, um, the hypersurface is null, and, and then we got this, um, uh, which is ruled by this null normal that is given to you, then the statement is that this, this vector field is always a uh, geodesic vector field. Not necessarily a finely parameterized, but a geodesic vector field. Uh, I think probably people don't know this. Is that correct? Or people know this? So the statement is that, so, so that, that, that's what we got. So the first property is that LA, gonna be LB, is proportional to LB. That is to say, so I got a three manifold, and therefore this three manifold uh, delta, we can say that this is given by some function f equal to constant. So, for example, I could look at u, the coordinate of this is constant. But there's some function f is equal to constant because I got a three manifold, right? And so every three manifold is defined by some. <laughs> one dimension load, so it's just some function is equal to constant defines the three manifold up here. So that means that grad AF is proportional to LA. Because LA is a null normal. So F is constant, so its gradient is going to be is going to be normal to the surface, uh, and therefore it is it's proportional to L up here. Okay. Please ask any questions if you have. So what this just means is that if I give you any tangent vector F PA grad AF. Is equal to zero. The only 
uh, this is equal to zero for all tangent vectors. Tangent vector fields T A, where got this equal to zero. That just says that this tangent that grad A must be normal because if it is perpendicular tangent vector is normal, that just says that. Okay, uh, the LA is the only vector field. Tangent to delta to tan surface such that GAB GAB equal to So the null normal is tangent is tangent to the three surface, but it is perpendicular to every vector in that three surface, including itself, because it is null. Okay. So that's what. So, so this is the first property. Now, how do we show that? Well, because we just start by saying uh, L is just given by uh, F times, uh, yeah, is, is proposed to that. So let us suppose that L A is equal to some, um, let's call it beta times gamma A. Right, it's proportional uh, proportional to grad A, so let's suppose the proportional to constant is beta, then L A grad A L B would just be equal to beta L A grad A beta L B. Right? I just I'm, I'm not doing any work so far. Now I just expand by, 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 by using Lightness rules, so I get here L A grad A uh, L B plus Plus, you already get the other term, which is beta L A grad A. Now, what I want to show you is that this is proportional to L. But L, as we just saw, is the only vector which is perpendicular to every tangent vector, T. Right? So, T is the only vector field tangent tangent to delta such that it's perpendicular to all t. So L is the only vector field which is for all t tangent to delta this is equal to zero. Therefore what I want to show is really that if I take L A grad A L B and plug into it T A, so T is an arbitrary vector field, so if I have to plug T A into it. I would like to show that if this is pro this will be proportional to L if and only if this is zero for every tangent vector field. Clear? No? Yes? yes. Anybody, any questions? I mean, it's not really profound, but okay. So the statement is that the question that we're asking up here, we want to show is that is this proportional to L? L A grad A L B is proportional to L, is the same as asking, is it true that if I take this vector field and in the product it with any vector which is tangent to the delta. Or tangent to delta. <coughs> so this, this is what you want to ask. So let's just calculate that and see what happens. So we just calculate this, right? Like, what, what is this? So I just put T into it. So when I put T into LA grad LB, LA grad LB is equal to this. If I put 2 into it, here I'm going to get TB times LB. And that, of course, is 0 already. Right? Because T is per T times L is always equal to 0. So I'll get T times L, that is always equal to 0. So I'll be left with just this term up here. So therefore, TB times LA grad A LB. I'm doing this all this excruciating boring detail. The reason is because people are not used to null surfaces. Null surfaces are a little bit counterintuitive. That's why we're doing it in detail. How did the beta appear in the, in the equation above the last equation? No, the one below. This one, yeah. Well, L is blue. L is equal to upside. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Thank you. It's wrong. That's why that's what people are confused about. <laughs> Well, this is gone wrong. That's what we So I'm just substituting this up here. So I'm get beta times, uh, I'll just like get LA times, not A times beta. It's 
better now? <laughs> that's, that, that's what I do. <laughs> You're proud of me. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Okay. So, so I'm just substituting L here and B to be equal to uh, this. Okay, so that was wrong up here. So therefore, so this is equal to this. And now what you are, now I think everybody understands that this is equal to uh, the question is L A and L B is going to be a proportion to L B. I'm sorry, I always cover the blackboard. Is proportion to L B if and only if um, D B L A grad A L B equal to zero for all vector fields. So this is what we get. So that this is what I'm going to calculate now. So this is just equal to uh, dBLA times. So let me write, raise the lower indices, just make it simpler. And then what B, there's nothing. I'm just raising and lowering these indices. I'm in four dimensions, and you can always do that. You always raise and lower the metric, and the metric commutes to the derivative operator. So this is perfectly fine. So we, we get this object up here. And that object, as we just saw, was equal to a times, not A times, Okay, so I just lower, raise and lower t, uh, the index p, that's all. Okay, so now we use, just use Leibniz rule. So I get here the two terms, I'm going to get t, b, uh, and a, not a, um, beta. Plus uh, B and A beta times A and B. Okay, <laughs> just using Leibniz rule, and that's all I get. Yeah, if I'm making some silly mistake, please let me know. So now this is just L. Um, sorry, T B is pro is on track with grad B F. F is constant, so grad F is normal to the surface, grad F is proportional to L, and therefore this con contraction is equal to zero, because this contraction, this term is zero, and therefore I'm just left with here, just, but now, because this is two, two derivatives, these are, these are symmetric, so I can switch them, and I can write that right as B A. And now I see here that I got here L A, grade of f. Right? So I can write this as pb times l a b time times grade b of grade f. So but grade f is just equal to l upon beta um, um, but now <coughs> when beta comes out I'm just get, going to get T B and A um, grad B times L A plus when beta stays in, L comes out, but L hits L and L is not, so I don't get anything else here. Okay. When when beta hits grad B, therefore then L comes out and I'll get L dot L and therefore I get zero. So we're just left with this. And now this of course is just equal to one half of T B times grad B of L dot L. Right. I'll just keep coming up here. L grad L is just equal to one half of that. If you expand this out by Leibniz rule, you'll just get twice this. That's why this factor of one half. But L dot L is zero on the surface. This zero on the surface doesn't does not mean that grad B of that is zero. But this is zero on the surface. And I'm really contracting it with a vector which is tangent to the surface. So within the surface, this is always equal to zero. So if I move within the surface, this, this is equal to zero. This is zero. That's what we are shown is that TB times this is equal to zero. For all tangent vector fields, 
here to delta. And therefore, the statement is that this implies that LA capital LB is equal to some alpha times LB. Because this is perpendicular to all tangent vectors, so it must be proportional to L. That's the only vector which is perpendicular to all vectors with a tangent shell. Therefore, by that. So the first remark is that the L vector field is a geodesic vector. But it's not necessarily a finely parameterized. We can do that. We can do that by just rescaling L. We can rescale it so that it becomes a geodesic L A grad A L B. L. We can rescale it by some fact function so that define L prime to be equal to some function times L such that L prime A grad A L prime B equal to zero. So we can do that. So these non-expanding horizons are ruled that null normal is always a geodesic line. So the second what ensures that there is only one node? Uh, um, so the statement is that, yeah, very good. So when, when we say it's a null surface, right? So if, <coughs> if there were another null vector, which is also tangential, thank you for the question. If there's another null vector, which is tangential to this thing, then I will have two null vectors, which are tangential. And the inner product between two null vectors is always if, let's suppose it's future directed. If not, you just change the sign and make it future directed. Um, the inner product between them is always less than or equal to zero. And is equal. So if it is less than zero, then there will be. Um, uh, okay. Then the signature of this manifold that we have up here would not be zero plus plus, right? Because there, is a, there are two vectors whose so inner product is minus one. So in that case, in fact, the the the, the Three manifold would be time like it would not be null. So if you're given a null vector, if you are given a null surface, then it has its null normal, but there cannot so there cannot be any other any time like vector tangential to it or any other null vector tangential. <coughs> because this is null normal, which means that every vector must have zero in a product with it. And if I get given a another time like or, co or another causal vector, time like or null vector, then the inner product is going to be say strictly negative unless the other vector is also null and coincides with the first one. Any other question? Please ask me questions. I mean, people do a little bit puzzled. This is not very profound. So there's no reason to be puzzled. So if you don't understand something, I may be saying something not right, like what happened in that equation. So don't hesitate to ask. So maybe my intuition is wrong about uh essentially Lorentz signature or something, but within a three manifold in a 4D space, don't we automatically know there's only one null? Or is it because of Lorentz you can have technically two nulls? Uh, two normals, sorry, two normals. <coughs> you have to show that there are no two null normals, right? No, he's not saying the other vector field is normal. I mean, not normal, there's going to be only one normal, right? Because it's, okay, okay. Because, but the question is, can it? Can there be another vector which is also tangential, oh, but, no. but, 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 but is null or time null? And the statement is that in that case, the manifold would not be null. In that case, the manifold would have signature plus or minus plus plus. If it is, then it will not be. Uh, okay. So on a null surface, you always have one null normal and every other vector which is tangential to it is space null. So that is why the signature is zero plus plus. Okay. So the, so the next thing that we want to show is that uh, so the second property. That in fact, Liel of this metric, so we define the metric QAB, this is signature 0 plus plus on, on the 3 manifold. Um, we, this is just defined to be equal to GAB, pulled back to QAB. Now, those of you who are not mathematically minded, this pullback seems complicated. I mean, you know, what are you talking about? But it's the most trivial thing that one can imagine. So just let me just tell you. So, so all this means is that for all vectors, TA, 
ที่ติดเลยการหยุดดาวซับที่ที่ที่ที่ This this is the product given any vector field that I use. It's just given by GAB. So QAB, but QAB only knows how to act on vector fields tangent to delta. G knows how to act on any vector field. So in this language, in this Picture that I, had, I was drawing before, I got this this L vector going like that. This was L, and then there was an N vector which is coming in. G will know how to act on N, but Q does not know how to act on N. Q knows only how to act on things which are tangential, <coughs> and that is why it's called pullback. Pullback just means you forget, you you prevent yourself from contracting G with any vector which is not tangential to the three manifold. And then what you get is an object which is intrinsic to the three to the three manifold. That is Q, and that is its property. Now, I just want to, again because it's good to get very very elementary things about null surfaces out of the way, so you don't get confused. So, so previously we also talked about a metric S up here. I also talked about a metric S A B, which is equal to G A B. It has signature plus plus. Um, G A B minus Y S A B. So plus. I, I think I made a mistake last time. Uh, I, I put my. I wrote it plus first, and then I changed the sign. So the second thing was wrong. The sign should have been plus and not minus in the in the definition of the of uh, S A B up here. Um, okay. Because if I plug it to they are both field directed, so they are inner product is equal to minus one. So if I plug into it LA, then I will get here I will get uh, LB, and here I will get minus LB. If in fact there is a plus sign here because the inner product is minus one. Okay, so I also have this S here. So this S is tied to this <coughs> surface. Whereas the pullback is not tied to anything. I, to, to talk about the pullback, I don't need to have a two surface. But to talk about S metric on the two surface, I need the two surface, of course, right? So, to, so, so this is all, knows how to attack it, but does not need. A specific two surface S. Whereas this, the SAB that we talked about, which is the, 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 the two sphere metric, and typically with the I mean, metric on a two sphere, that metric does need a particular two surface to be talked about. But if you give me for all vector fields, let's call it SA and S tilde A, tangent to S, who I got SA S tilde A times SAB. This metric up here is the same as the SAS delta A GAB. But since these two S and S delta are in particular tangent to the three manifold, they happen to be also tangent to the surface, then in here we know that GAB TA T tilde, where T is any vector field tangent, this is true, so this is also equal to SA. S delta A. So if there are tangent vectors, so Q only knows how to op operate on tangent vectors to, to the three manifold. S only knows how really how to. It's a metric on the two sphere, and the statement is that if you restrict yourself to tangent vectors up here, you will get the same answer with S as you will get with G, so you will get with Q. Again, I I just don't know if I'm. It's all too trivial, or whether it's worth saying it. Right? It's okay. You you got it. It's okay. So these are all. Things about the two, two manifolds, uh, about the null manifolds, and then now we can. <clears throat> so the statement that have the third property, sorry, 
QAB is the third asset, second property. QAB, so QAB is supposed to be the metric. So QAB is the degenerate metric. of this non-manifold delta is intrinsic property. And of course, QAB, LB is equal to zero, and that is why signature is zero plus plus. QAB is cap is annihilated just by, by, the, by the, the, the vector, null vector L and by no other vector. So that is, so QAB. <coughs> signature is plus one. Okay. All right. Uh, by a trivial typo, just so people don't get confused, yeah. the last line of the board you just finished, the S A S till D B. Thank you. And similarly throughout. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please correct me because I think I agree with you that things can be confusing. S A S till that. So I call them S because the tangent <laughs> this this manifold and S A B is a metric on the two manifold. So S always refers to that two manifold. Uh, okay. So QAB is degenerate metric. And now the next property is that Liel of QAB. <coughs> now this will be a homework problem, but I'm going to tell you how to show that. It's not very, very difficult to show. So basically, the statement is that QAB, as we saw, is the pullback of GAB. So therefore, Liel of GAB of QAB is the same as <coughs> Liel of GA pull back. So you're going, given a tensor field and you're pulling back to the manifold. Okay. So um, so there's a so this room is a manifold. Think of this as being a sub-manifold. Everything should be one higher dimension. This should be four dimensional, this should be uh, two-dimensional, but uh, sorry, this should be this this should be three-dimensional, uh, but it's only two dimensional. Okay, but let's suppose we are in this room. And then the statement is that I take the metric in this, in this room and pull it back here. Pull back metric is just a fancy way to say that the tensor field knows how to act, act only on, on vectors which are tangential here. So I get some metric up here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm taking a lead derivative of this metric. Now L is tangential to this surface. So the lead derivative is well defined within these two surfaces. Uh, okay, L is completely well defined in this, in this surface up here. But now, what, how, however, what I can do is, I know that the metric Q here is a pullback of the metric in this room. Pullback of the metric. So I can just extend this L any way I want outside, keeping it tangential here. And I can now consider a diffeomorphism in this room. I just map the metric to it, it's, you know, uh, 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 along these diffeomorphisms. That's what we're doing by the derivative. I mean, that's the infinitesimal action of the diffeomorphism. So I can take the metric and then evaluate it at a point and pull it back. So I can act, act by the lead derivative and then pull back. Or I can just pull back the metric and act on the lead derivative. Since the action of the diffeomorphism on this manifold is the same, because it's a vector field which is tangent to man. The two, are, two things agree with each other, so the statement is a Therefore, this is the same as the real of GAB pull back. But we all know what this is. This is just two times grade LB symmetrized pull back. Okay. This is a thing. So that is to say, what we want to show is that if you give me any vector <laughs> fields which are tangential to the three manifold delta. And just with two manifold, three manifold delta, then I want to show that this object. So I want to show that this is equal to zero. That is to say, I want to show that this is equal to zero. That is to say, I want to show the pullback of this is equal to zero. That's the same as saying that this object equal to zero. Okay. So to show this is the same as this, I reply. If this is equal to zero, is the same as asking if this is equal to zero. So now what you can do is, you can consider. Here is a here is a horizon that is given to you. Or I can just draw it now just like that. Just do it. So this is our delta. 
just to sort of visually say that the area is not changing. This looks like time life is actually null. The vector field here is L. And the area is not changing up here. So that, and then what I'm trying to ask is, I, I, what I'm asking is, is it true that TAT tells the AB, regarding LB, semi prize is equal to zero? Well, what you can do is, given any vector T, I can write it with a, we don't need a metric for that, uniquely as a vector along LA, say alpha times LA, and a vector which is in, in these two surfaces. I just choose some two surfaces, so this is a horizontal vector. So the statement is that I can always write TA as alpha times LA plus some horizontal vector. This is tangential to this two manifold S that we got up here. And similarly, T tilde A, alpha tilde and F tilde up here. And then you can just plug up here and then expand and use L A grade L B is proportional to L B and the shear of L is equal to zero and the expansion of L is equal to zero. That would imply that T tilde A B, B, in fact, for your exercise, you would like to, you might just forget about this symmetry transition altogether. And even this is true. Okay. Just use the fact that this is shear, that the L is shear free, L is expansion free, and it's geodesic. And you want to show that this is equal to zero, because this is equal to zero is the same as this is equal to zero. Why? Because linear of QAB is the same as Leal of pullback of GAB, which is the same as leal of GAB whole pullback, which is really the same as two times grade LB pullback. And this quantity will be zero if and only if the contraction in any tangent vector fields is equal to zero. And that's what we are trying to show. Take a tangent vector field, expanding it in these two ways, and just expand it out, and you'll see that because this is important, precisely because if this is cheap, to get null geodesic is cheap, because given any null surface, L will be a null geodesic vector field. So this will be always be the case. But, and then it will not be the case that, um, that, the, that the metric will be lead right. But because the expansion is zero and the shear is zero, then the statement is that the metric is actually lead right. So this will be a homework problem, and these are the steps that we have. And in fact, what we are going to show in the homework problem is that this is equal to zero. You don't even need a symmetrization up here. It is just equal to zero. And just use it. Just, just plug in, expand out. You just have to understand each, 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 each step there. Okay. So, so we saw two properties. One is that it is geodesic, and the second is that that uh, that QAB is the drag. Now, what does it mean? QAB is the drag. Now we are getting some physics out here. Because QAB is the intrinsic geometry up here. The intrinsic geometry doesn't have to be that of a two sphere. The intrinsic geometry can be rippled, can be quite complicated. You know, the, the area is constant, but it can be quite complicated, can have any, any multiple structure. In fact, we're going, we're going to see, again, <coughs> I hope to do it today, but next time, we'll see that in fact this, this geometry has many, many multiples, and in fact, when the black holes first collide and the new horizon is formed, in fact, that, that uh, manifold would have very complicated structure. But even if a black hole settles down, we have curved uniqueness theorem. So if there was nothing else in the universe, then this geometry will settle down, and it will not be a round two sphere, but it will be the two sphere like on the curve horizon, which has a certain amount of distortion. It has a certain amount of multiple moments. So this Q has a lot of information that we're going to see in a minute. By the way, if we have Last week we had all this PAX meeting, and we had all these very beautiful talks, and we heard that in fact, when the two neutrons are collided, and then finally the final black hole form, there is an accretion disk around it, and the accretion disk has about 10% of the mass of the black hole, I mean, of that order, a few per six percent, seven percent. So the multiple moments of the horizon in that case are not those of curve; they differ because this accretion disk distorts the black hole horizon. And the multiple moments are going to be different. 
And how can you calculate them and so on? We're going to see, see next time. So this multiple moment, even for the isolated horizon, when the black hole settles down, the multiple moments are not necessarily those of Kerr, if in fact there are accretion disk or magnetic fields. Another calculation that two students here at that time, Steve Ferris and Badri Krishnan had done, was to, sh they found, they, they did a very nice paper um, about these isolated horizons, uh, they found that if you have a, a black hole in a uniform <coughs> magnetic field that is given to you, then in fact, again, the multiple moments are distorted. But for a 10 solar mass black hole, they found that if you have 10 to the 17 Gauss magnetic field, then the multiple moment distortion is 10%, which is quite a lot. And yesterday what we were told about was that in these collisions, the magnetic fields that are produced are of the order of 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 Gauss. So it is not quite 10 percent, it's going to be 1 percent or 0.1 percent. But these are physical effects that have to be captured when you LIGO become much, much more sensitive. And that's why I'm doing all these things in great detail. So you, you will be able to do calculations. I could have just stated these things, but I would like you to be able to calculate things and you will be able to see what is multiple. Oh, can I ask a yeah. question? Namely, if you have, let's say, the curved black hole is, is axisymmetric. And if you have an accretion disk around it, which is also axis symmetric, then the full geometry has to be axis symmetric, sure. and then it has to be curved. No, 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 no! That's this is the big mistake, mistake, right? There is no uniqueness theorem, right? Sorry. Oh yeah. Okay. There is no uniqueness theorem for the for the for the. Okay. Short shield, there will be uniqueness things. If it's spherically symmetric, yeah. then it has to be short shield outside. But if it's axis symmetric. There's no reason for it to be there. In fact, there's infinite family of solutions known, right? Which is the wild solutions, which is not rotating, but a complete solutions known, and they include this accretion disk and so on. But then <coughs> the black hole is not rotating. But I thought the uniqueness theorem uh, fails only for certain kinds of fields. I mean, you were saying no, no, giving examples it, of those young men's fields. Yeah, because those are the fundamental fields. So I was talking about Einstein Maxwell theory, Einstein Young Mills theory, and so on and so forth. Right. And there, what we saw was that uniqueness theorem would fail if you have Einstein Young Mills theory, but then Young Mills field would have to be in a phase which is not confined, but is, is false of like one upon R. That's the statement. So, sorry, I get excited. Please excuse me. That's precisely what we want to know. So, the statement is that, um, uh, yeah, uh, so, so if you have just a regular perfect fluid or matter, there are disk around it, then the solution is not Kerr. Kerr is really, uniqueness is proved for vacuum solutions, period. There's nothing else. I, mean, and I was giving examples of even when you have fundamental fields, it is, it is not. Okay. If you have map, if you just have perfect fluid, because of wild solutions, we knew it was not true. But the question was, if with fundamental fields, does it fail or not? Okay. So there are just five minutes, and then we have to quit. So okay, this is what we have. So what this tells us is very interesting thing. It says that, yes, we didn't really ask for it, but in fact, yeah, one minute. We didn't ask for it, but we found that in fact the three geometry that we had is at the, of the, the metric that we got up here is also time time independent. So we wanted to talk about something is isolated, right? Is is, and we just saw that well, with the, if in fact we've got not expanding horizon, then nothing is falling across it. But does it mean? that the geometry of the horizon is not changing in time? The answer is yes. So that's all I want to say. So that the second property implies, thus, the metric QAB of three nations zero plus plus, and its curvature. Its curvature is what calculates, the, which, which, what encodes the mass of multiple moments, and the statement of this is time independent. So in this sense, the horizon is in equilibrium, in the sense, not only is nothing falling into it, <coughs> but in fact, it is, it's the fact that the intrinsic two metric, so it's not only that the area is not changing. I mean, there are many ways in which area may not be changing, but the metric might, might be changing because area has very small information about the metric, right? Metric is three components, area is only one, area form even is only one, and total area is, 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 is global quantity. Uh, so, so what we have shown is that surprisingly, this simple looking definition captures the idea that the metric itself is not changing in time. Okay. And then we'll continue next time, we'll just finish <coughs> what this all tells us and talk about multiple moments. And if there's time, we begin with the dynamical situation. Okay, thank you. Okay, again, those who are taking the course for credit.